The summer has been challenging, as we, as we all know, um, and um, the impacts of um, smoke on our populations, particularly up, up the eastern seaboard, have been significant. And um, so it's, um, it's, it's very relevant to the work that we've been doing here uh, uh, within CSIRO and the Bureau and through a bunch of universities um, with, with DELP support for these last um, five, eight years. And what I wanted to do was to um, just introduce you to um, AQFX, which is the smoke forecasting system that we've been developing, and just show you um, some of the background to it and look under the hood at some of the, the science components that go into that system. And um, what I've um, put up in my first slide is um, it's the bushfire plan burn conundrum. And I've um, frozen it back to um, what we are looking at in 2016 and then just also added in some information, which is you know, very relevant to the fires that we've just recently had across um, the eastern seaboard of Australia. This whole system was basically instigated because of the, um, the, Black, the Black Saturday fires that we had. And one of the outcomes of that was a Royal Commission course. You know, we had, ter we had terrible loss of life. Um, loss of um, assets and um, what came out of the Royal Commission was a recommendation that the um, Victorian government burn 5% of um, public land as an annual rolling target to try and reduce the risk of catastrophic bushfires. And of course one of the externalities of that is you have a lot of smoke. And there's been a lot of work done in Australia and across the world which shows that ambient smoke um, from burning vegetation has health impacts and um, they are not insignificant under some circumstances. And so at that time then, what was put together was a, um, a project to see if we could provide a system which would give advance warning of where the smoke impacts would be from these prescribed burns. And that was sort of the synthesis and the starting point of AQFX. It was trying to protect the population and to help with the management of these prescribed burns so that we could hit these targets of um, vegetation um, reduction and vegetation management of the uh, of, of you know large fires and so that's what started the whole project up and what I have in the plot here is um, a couple of things which look at that um, it does only run out to 2015 2016 you know that was that snapshot in time when, when we pulled this together and the top plot on the left shows um, the area of prescribed burns that's going on from year to year and um, the area of the wildfires at that, at that stage. We call them bushfires, the rest of the world calls them wildfires. And then the percentage of that area which was prescribed burns. And it showed that for um, the majority of the years, um, most of the area burned was due to um, prescribed burns. And you know, they all put out smoke. Um, but given the prescribed burns are, are controlled and managed by us, by DELP, um, then that was what we would then target through um, doing smoke forecasting. And of course, that's now changed as we got out to 2019, 2020, where we have had a massive area burnt through the bushfires. Um, but we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, and also just from this slide here, to give you an indication, if you um, look at the bottom left plot, this is the area or the number of planned burns that were undertaken in 2014, 2015. And if you assume, you know, roughly a 20 kilometer radius of influence of smoke, you can see that there is the potential for quite a large area um, to be impacted by smoke, including quite a number of the uh, rural and capital city population um, areas. And so it is a conundrum managing the intensity and, and, and the risk of wildfires, and then managing that externality of smoke through doing planned burns um, and you know, trying to minimise the impact on the population. So that's what that's about. And of course, so that was um, the snapshot when we were looking back at uh, this in 2016. And of course, 2019, 2020, we had something like 12 million hectares plus burned, 34 lives tragically lost and over 3,000 houses lost too up the eastern seaboard. And the initial indications too though are that we may have lost hundreds of people due to smoke exposure because the smoke exposure was significant um, and it hit a lot of um, densely populated areas including the rural regions. So um, it is never, smoke is never um, just the minimal impact in terms of these types of events. It's a significant impact but it's one of these ones where um, it's, it's impacting people who may have preconditioned 
pre-existing conditions, you know, um, heart problems, um, uh, uh, some sort of lung disease, asthma. And so um, you, you get that impact then through those people being um, exposed to smoke. What came out of um, that initial work was what we called the, the Victorian Smoke Forecasting Project. Um, it was funded by, by DELP, so Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, and also CSRO put in, fund, put in federal funding as well. We just saw the significance of um, the importance of doing this. And um, to pull together this smoke forecasting project, well, what do we need to do? We need to be able to characterise the different types of fuel, particularly coarse woody debris. This is the stuff that smoulders away after the fire, sort of flash through along the fire front. And the coarse woody debris in particular smoulders away and um, continues to smoke for a number of days, which has quite an impact. So we needed to build in that information. We needed to understand um, what sort of emissions of smoke, particles and gases we would get from burning Victorian vegetation. So we went into the field to make those sorts of measurements and, and I'll briefly go through that. And then um, from that, we were then doing numerical forecasting. It's a bit like weather forecasting, except on top of it, we we're also doing smoke forecasting. Um, it sort of sits on the back of the weather forecasting, and that's why we work very closely with the Bureau. And all of that information then goes into the State Control Centre for decision making, um, whether to you know, manage prescribed burns or whether to do you know, population-wide warnings of big smoke plumes coming through from bushfires. So numerical forecasting means that what we're really doing is we're, we're solving the equations of um, energy and mass conservation and, and uh, chemical reactions to then simulate what we think is going on in the atmosphere with the smoke. So we, we're simulating the, uh, the, the fire propagation behaviour and then um, simulating the smoke emissions from the fires and then simulating those emissions being transported in the winds, the meteorology that come from the, the Bureau of Meteorology weather forecasts and the chemical reactions of the smoke as it goes along and then the impacts down at ground level. So it's all done with computer software which describes mathematical algorithms of what is going on. The way that we ran it, and we, and we built it by talking and working very closely with DELP um, as to you know, how they managed, for example, um, the prescribed fires and where they needed to start to be able to gather information as to undertake these prescribed fires um, or whether there were bushfires coming. And so the system that we built, AQFX, was divided into three tiers. And the first tier gave us a three to six day forecast ahead where we, we basically forecast um, things like um, grass fire danger index and forest fire danger index. Um, the rate of ventilation, which is how quickly smoke will blow out of a given region. So high ventilation values are good, low ventilation values are poor for air quality. But then on the, 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 the opposite side of that is high ventilation values are also risky if you've got a fire or a bushfire which you don't want to then sort of get out of control because um, you know, hot weather, windy conditions is dangerous. And um, so we provided information out to six days um, for any sort of region across Victoria of um, the fire danger indices, whether it's grassland or forests. And in addition to providing a specific value for each location, uh, we also provided an uncertainty because the further out you go in time, the more um, uncertainty your forecasts have. So you have to build that in, to, um, in into the forecast that you have. And one of the things I've um, um, realised from working in the State Control Centre is that the people in there are very good at dealing with uncertainty and factoring that into their decision making. So um, it's important to include this sort of information in the forecast that we provide. So that's our Tier 1 forecast, which goes out to six days or more. The Tier 2 forecasting is um, where we actually look at uh, you know, one, one to three days, and, and here we're now explicitly modelling all of the emissions that lead to high concentrations of pollution. You're going to hear me talk a lot about PM 2.5 and PM 2.5 are very, very small particles. So they're, they're less than 2.5 uh, microns in size and they're of interest and of significance because they're the size where you can very readily uh, breathe them into your lungs. and. Um, the even smaller ones can then also make their way into your bloodstream and then the even smaller ones can make their way through into your brain. So these very, very fine particles have the potential to 
infiltrate into all parts of your body. And there's now been a lot of work done showing that these PM2.5 particles can lead to both short-term health effects and then much longer-term health effects too, and in some cases, increased mortality. So I'll talk quite a lot from now on about PM2.5. So these are those very fine smoke particles. And you know, not forgetting too that, uh, of course, when you have smoke, you have particles of all ranges and sizes all the way through to ash. And there's also a whole lot of gases that are released too. Um, but this is what we're using to look at health impacts. And so this tier two um, forecasting is where we actually run a model which takes in all of the emissions from the fires, um, takes the Bureau of Meteorology weather forecasts, and also it takes in the emissions from many other sources of PM2.5 too. Um, so from cities um, in the rural area, from domestic wood combustion, for example, so wood heaters sea salt goes into there and a whole bunch of other different things because in the end it's total loading of pm 2.5 that matters for health and so we need to provide that information to um, help with advanced warning of potential health impacts and this tier 2 information is at a large scale so it's not only victoria but um, it actually spans the whole of australia and i'll give you an example in a moment as to why that's important and then the third tier of the forecasting is where we work very closely with DELP and the State Control Centre in planning um, prescribed burning for the following day. And the way that that works is um, we get a whole lot of information from the DELP teams as to what they would like to burn on the following day. We run that through a forecasting, the forecasting system through AQFX and we advise them as to where we think the smoke will go from any of those planned burns for the following day. And that information then feeds back into their management system and is one of the um, pieces of information which will influence as to whether they will go ahead with a planned burn or not. So that's the tier three. And you can see that each of the tiers is for a shorter and shorter time scale, but has more and more information sort of a cascading time scale of information. And it's very much attuned to what will be most helpful for our DELP colleagues with the available science that we have at the moment. Anecdotally, we, we, we generally did quite well with, with the large scale fires. You know, in fact, the forecasting system, AQFX, was running for the whole of Australia. Um, and so we were able to um, show in the forecast the transport of um, the smoke from the fires up and down the eastern seaboard, sort of connecting all the major regions. Um, it's early days, but, but on the whole, we, we um, did quite well in, in forecasting the events. Um, there may have been some occasions where we didn't get the fire emissions right, for example, where we'd had some rain go through and... Um, that may have quenched the fires more in our forecasting than was observed in reality. Um, but that's okay. I mean, that's something we'll now go away and look at and learn from and improve um, just to cover us in case this ever happens again. What I wanted to do now then was look under the hood of AQFX. So it does these forecasts, you know, 24, 74 hours, uh, 72 hours for, for um, the large-scale smoke and 24 hours or so for prescribed burns. How is it all of that done? And what I'm showing here on the slide is um, basically the system that goes in, into it. And where it really starts is um, fuel maps. So, you know, what's the vegetation that's going to be burned? You know, what's its, what's its moisture? Um, what's its behaviour when you actually burn it? And that feeds through into the fire behaviour modelling. So how will the fire propagate during the course of a day or, or a few days? And then given how that fire is behaving, what are the emissions of smoke that come from that fire over time and how do they vary over that time of the order of hours through to um, a few days? And so that's the smoke composition because we want to know how many particles are coming out, how many fine particles that people can breathe in. And then an important component of that too is how hot is the smoke? How high, how high will the smoke plume go? And we'd all remember from these 2019-2020 um, fires, 2020, there were smoke plumes that were so hot they made their way into the stratosphere. And those ones went around the world, but they weren't really influencing local smoke concentrations at ground level where people were breathing it. They were, you know, leading to other potential issues such as visibility and feeding into um, greenhouse gases and particles and things. Um, but 
away from the local situation. So working out how high the smoke goes and whether it will interact with the grounds and where people are living or not is a key part of this modelling. And then the next bit is, yeah, where will this stuff blow? Um, so will it go into the stratosphere and then make its way around the world? Will it be transported from, you know, a local fire area to a, a large population centre? And that part's pretty much done with the Bureau of Meteorology forecasting model for the weather because the weather is telling you where the winds are and we link into that and we let those winds move the smoke along. Then another important part is um, when the, um, the smoke comes out, it actually chemically reacts in the atmosphere. And one of the outcomes of that chemical reacting is you can, over the course of 24, 48 hours, double the amount of mass of particles um, in the smoke plume. So as it, as it gets older and older, the smoke plumes actually can increase in particle size and mass and potentially therefore become more harmful over time, which is um, why if you have stuff, um, smoke hanging around for a few days, you know, in principle, that can become more dangerous. The other thing about that too is um, we've been um, talking with the, um, the agricultural industry and, and in particular with the wine industry and there are components that come out with the fires um, which can lead to grape taint, for example. And you know, we've probably all heard about the challenges they've had in the Hunter Valley and um, down in South Australia, Barossa Valley, um, with the smoke leading to grape taint in the grapes, which then ruins a crop for, for wine. And um, there are specific chemicals within the, the smoke which lead to that grape taint, but over time they age and decay away. And so if we can also manage the forecasting of that, then we have a tool which will be useful for um, the agricultural industry and particularly um, vineyards at the current time. Given all of that, um, we can then predict or forecast what the ground level PM 2.5 concentrations are. So this is the mass of all the final, fine particles um, at regions downwind of the smoke. And what I'm showing at the bottom here is just the area over which we actually do the forecasting and it's saying it's fine particle forecasts, which include not only smoke, which in this example is all of this material in here, but there's also other forms too. This is sea salt fine particles. Um, this is smoke and there's dust in there and there are some other components of fine particles as well. And we need to include all of that because it's the sum of the more which then impact your health. One of the challenges, of course, is um, you, you have the, the flaming component of the fire as that's moving along on the fire front and um, you have a lot of smoke emissions from that and of course if it's very hot um, the, the smoke emissions go very high and in fact may not impact the local communities and, um, and, and the local people. But then behind that you have um, a lot of the, the, the thicker wood components, the coarse woody debris as, as we like to call it, which smoulders away for days and days. And um, that's smouldering away, it's not so hot, the smoke tends to hug the ground a lot more and um, so that has the impact to, uh, the, well, the potential to impact on communities for quite a number of days. But it does raise the question, um, so why are we modelling that entire region if our focus at the moment is on Victoria? And I thought I'd just take you through and show you an animation of some um, modelling that we did which looks at um, pollution um, from various sources of particles across Australia and how it interacts. So this is a simulation for um, January 2006 and um, it's got smoke in there, windblown dust, sea salt aerosol and also particles that form from um, emissions of some gases from trees. You know, the Blue Mountains are blue because um, trees emit some volatile gases and then they form into particles. And um, if you have a look at this, um, the yellow components are windblown dust, the red is um, smoke going gradually brown as it ages. Um, you occasionally see purple pop up, which is from the vegetation, and, and the blue is the sea salt aerosol. And so this was in um, January 2006, where we had very large alpine fires um, along the northeastern um, border of Victoria and extending into New South Wales. And the information to take from this is that the smoke and the particles travel very, very long distances. And you can see within there how you know, the smoke within Victoria then can make its way down to Tasmania or into New South Wales, um, or the smoke from the Northern Territory can work its way down 
into Western Australia or, or under some conditions down onto the eastern seaboard. So when we're thinking about the impact of um, fires um, in Victoria, we actually need to think about that impact with all of the other sources across Australia because the pollution doesn't see state boundaries and territory boundaries. It goes straight across them and that long range transport, as we call it, can have a significant um, impact on, on what we're seeing locally. And in fact, we've seen that this year. We've seen that with the 2019, 2020 fires where you know, Melbourne was, um, for example, hit by um, very high levels of particles, which were actually formed up on um, the northeastern border of, of um, Victoria and, and all the way into New South Wales. And I'll show you another example in the middle of where that occurs. So that's why we have to look at the whole of Australia, even though the forecasting is for Victoria. Um, let's talk now about fire behaviour modelling. So we need to do fire behaviour modelling because if there is a fire going, we have to be able to forecast how that's going to evolve over the next 24, 48 hours. Because as the fire evolves, that's emitting smoke. And um, as the fire grows, then the amount of smoke being emitted grows over time as well. And as the fire gets hotter, then the smoke goes higher. So this whole thing ends up being a coupled system that we need to build into, into the forecasting. So the Bureau of Meteorology are running AQFX operationally for New South Wales and Victoria at this stage. And they have plans to roll it out across the whole of Australia over the next two years. Um, what we would like to do in terms of supporting that is also to roll out um, wide-scale deployment of our smog units so that we have extensive ground level measurements of PM 2.5 to augment what's already done by the state environment protection authorities and you know to cover off on the regions so the more observations that we have the more accurate we can make the forecasts I wanted to show you an example of um, one of the fire behavior models that we, we use. We, we use a couple. One's called Phoenix, developed by uh, Melbourne University. Another one's called Spark, which has been developed within CSIRO. And this is just a bit of insight into um, how these models can be developed. So we have this um, wonderful installation called the CSIRO Pyrotron, which is basically a wind tunnel oven. And, uh, what it does is you can put in a bed of um, <clears throat> fuel types, whatever you choose it to be, and then light it up and um, blow a wind across it and then look at how that fire evolves. And it gives you then a lot of information about the behaviour of that fire. And in this plot here, we're showing the actual fire burning on the left and we've got a, a wind blowing across from, from the left to the right. And then the top right is sort of a rectified video of how that fire region is evolving. And then the bottom right is um, a model that we use to simulate that fire. And that model um, can then be used, you know, both at the scale of this, um, this pyrotron, but it's also been tested at, at larger scales for test plots for, you know, like burning grasses and things. And then it also gets applied for much larger fires too from, um, from forests and things. And it's this sort of system that go, goes into um, AQFX. So if we know there's a fire burning, because we can see it safe in satellite, then we can use that to trigger the model, which will then forecast how that fire will evolve over time. And of course, the primary use of these um, types of models is for um, property and, and, um, and uh, well, well, for, for um, providing advanced forecasting for people really to, um, to evacuate from properties, you know, so it's saving lives. But one of the other useful outcomes of it from our point of view is it helps us forecast where the smoke is going to come from over time. And um, so this is sort of relatively small scale. It's, it's doing uh, basically, you know, a, a few, a few metres, but um, again, it's been um, tested on outdoor scales as well. And, um, perhaps not on the largest fires that we've seen this year, where the fires can then influence the weather, which feed back on the fires, but certainly up to the, up to the scales where um, you can sort of decouple the weather from the fire itself. And so um, this and, the, and Phoenix, which is the other model we use, are very powerful tools for, for um, working with the smoke predictions, the smoke forecasting. So going then from um, forecasting how uh, the fires actually behave, um, we've done a whole lot of work on um, what are the emissions of the pollution from those fires. And again, this has involved um, 
on the whole, going out into the field for where there are prescribed burns, for example, characterising the fuel, which is on the top left there of that um, plot, um, and then doing smoke composition observations where we actually have people going out close to the fire itself and with those sort of pretty cool Ghostbuster backpacks um, um, sampling the smoke from the fires and from that they can then do an analysis of what's the particle um, concentrations and types and what's the gas, fire gas emission particle, uh, so um, concentrations and types as well. And, then that's what goes into our models. And that can be done by either people going very close to the fires or using instruments that um, um, send a beam of light across the fire itself and sort of integrate it across. So that's the work that we're seeing there in the, um, the bottom left hand side. And then on the right we're also very interested in well how much heat is generated by the fires. And um, measuring the combustion energy or the heat flux is, is important because that determines how high the smoke goes. So will it punch through the top of the boundary layer, maybe make it into the stratosphere and go around the world, or will it stay within the boundary layer and mix down and become an air pollution problem? Um, so AQFX is based on all of these sorts of fundamental observations. And one of the things that's come out of that work is that some of the most significant emissions come from smouldering combustion. So you can think of a fire as um, you know, a hot flaming component that moves quickly and um, the vegetation burns for perhaps 10 minutes or five minutes as that fire propagates through and you know that's very dangerous because it's got a radiant heat and that's what can lead to houses catching fire and potentially loss of life. But then what happens after that? Well, you have a whole lot of um, larger wood components and, and undergrowth which continues to smolder, and that smoldering can occur for days. And um, that smoldering is what we would call low efficiency in that it's not very hot, so um, it's quite gluggy and there's a lot of particles in it. It's persistent because it lasts for a few days, and because it's not very hot, it hugs the ground. And so it can be there day and night. And you can imagine that that's then a source of um, smoke, or PM 2.5, that can be quite dangerous for the population. So that second component. And um, we've seen that. Uh, we saw that with the, um, the Hazelwood um, mine fire. You know, it's persisted for quite a number of weeks. And more recently for the Copton fires, um, which also persisted for a number of weeks. And there's been many other cases. There's the Indonesian peat fires. Um, Port Macquarie fires also went along, uh, you know, have been quite a significant um, source of um, this, this low impact smoldering. So this second component um, in some ways is maybe even more important than, than the high level flaming emissions, of course, depending upon the size of the fire. And so we've done a lot of work in measuring the particle emissions from this particular source of um, smoke, the smoldering combustion, as we say, and that goes into the forecasting models. So you had the fire going, um, and the flaming part of it and, and, and the smoke that goes very high and then in the model you'll have this other smoldering component which will just persist day to day to day as it gradually decays down over time. We know that um, from um, studies that have been done overseas and in Australia that the longer term health impacts can be um, uh, cancers, um, uh, the increase in, in risk of mortality um, for cardiovascular um, issues, um, for um, asthmatics, um, for, you know, for, for, for anyone really who's sort of at risk with um, cardiovascular type, type issues. And that risk can increase with the length of exposure. So short term, um, short term exposure, we'll find that you know, most people will, will recover from that. Um, Long-term exposure, if it was over the course of a year or more, then we, we start to see you know, relatively high um, risks. And then that intermediate period where it may run for a few months, it's less clear at this stage as to what the long-term effects will be. We've had things like the Hazelwood um, mine fire where we had you know, sort of intermediate periods of exposure and some of the studies um, coming from that are showing that there are ongoing health effects. So it's an area for research. So we had this system set up by 2016 and as it turned out, um, almost on the first day that we used it, we had the 2016 Tasmanian fires. And a key thing about those fires is 
one, they were, they were very significant. The other thing is um, they, within a very short period of time, um, blew smoke over the Victorian coastline and across Melbourne. And people, of course, are quite keyed into the smell of smoke. And um, that impact of the smoke led to a lot of consternation in our populations across Victoria. Um, with you know, lots of calls to triple O, I think there's a local fire, I can smell smoke. And so this system was then able to be used to say, no, actually it's from, it's from Tasmania, you're okay, there's nothing nearby. Um, at this point in time, you, you're okay and you don't have to move around. So this was caused by dry lightning. And um, as we see in the slide there, there's 229 vegetation fires were burnt. It went all the way through from January to March. Well, we were lucky there and fortunate there was no loss of life and the asset damage was small, although the environmental damage was not small at all. So that was the first um, case that we, 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 we modelled in the forecasting system. And I thought I would just show you the outcomes of the modelling for that. And, and what I've got here with this animation has a few different components to it. Um, the actual fine particle forecasts are in the blue going through all the way up into um, pink when the concentrations get very high. You can see some big circles which are colour matched to the forecasts and those big circles are observations. So when the forecast has the same colour as those, the circles, the observations, then it's a good forecast. Um, you can see flowing underneath um, is the cloud which we, we got from um, Himawari 8 which is a geostationary satellite so you can sort of see that's roughly represented the meteorology and where the winds are blowing. And the other thing that we have in there is a time series of the observed, the modelled forecast. So both for, um, you know, Tasmania, but also for Melbourne, Sydney, and all the way up to Brisbane. And I should point out too that, that some of the um, fine particles you can see in there are actually dust. And that's what we're seeing towards the top of the, the plot there. But in that example where uh, we're looking at now, um, that the smoke plumes have gone all the way up to Bruceman and that came through both in the observations and we were luckily able to forecast it. Um, and, and so this is just an, an example of how far the smoke can go um, and why there's therefore a need um, to be able to forecast large regions across Australia from, from sources which can be quite remote because the, the concentrations can be significant. And of course, um, one of the important things to do with this, this forecasting is to see how accurate the model is, to understand the biases and the uncertainties. And so for that um, Tasmanian fire, this, this is a, a time series plot of the hourly concentrations of fine particles across the month of January for um, a number of different sites in, in, um, across Tasmania and you know, observed and modelled. And, and what you can conclude from that is that if you're very close to a fire, it can be quite difficult to predict the exact concentrations or concentrations within a factor or two because very close to the fire, the, the smoke plume is narrow and it meanders around on very short sort of time periods and it's hard to track that with the model. But as you get a little bit further away, tens of kilometres to you know, 50 kilometres, 100 kilometres, then the model starts to do a lot better in terms of tracking those actual impacts over time. And that's what can be seen from um, this information here. In fact, the model's done quite well, but it, in, it um, goes from challenge to going quite well as you increase in distance away from the actual fire source itself. So that was Tasmania. This is now looking um, further away. Uh, well, here we're looking at impacts across Melbourne and Sydney. And what's been plotted up here is um, the observed fine particles, the PM 2.5 versus the forecast both with and without fires. And around the 24th and 25th of January, you can see, say, in, um, well, here I'm looking at the top two plots, um, Prospect and Irwood in Sydney got impacted quite strongly by the fires in Tasmania, and the forecast model was able to um, predict that very well. And then down in, um, in Melbourne, La Trobe Valley, Footscray, you can see there was one major event too that went through around the 25th. And again, the forecasting system was quite helpful in predicting that case. And on top of that, um, here we are looking out in Brisbane where they also saw an event around the 25th, 26th of January. And again, 
the forecast model was able to um, forecast that an event would be likely in that period. And the fact that these, these forecasts were really quite good is probably because the weather forecasts were really quite good because the forecast smoke direction and the travel time is really dictated by the wind forecasts which come out from the Bureau of Meteorology, so the transport component of it. Um, so it indicates that was doing quite well for these cases. Since then, we've been asked by DELP to um, further refine it. And, and two areas that they were very keen that we did work on was what we call near real-time forecasting. So what do we think is going to happen within the next hour? What's going on at the moment um, across Victoria? How can that feed into doing decision-making that will influence what's going to go on for the rest of the day? So both DELP and also the Environment Protection Authority of Victoria. Should we be alerting schools, for example, that they need to keep their children indoors um, or aged care centres? So, you know, quite short time scales. So we were asked to look at how we could um, provide better near real-time forecasting tools rather than, you know, here is what we're going to see in 24 hours hence. And the other thing too was to um, work at engaging more of our communities, our um, rural communities, to understand when smoke was seen as an issue by then. And, um, you know, so, so what sort of smoke forecast levels should we be communicating to them so that they could um, maybe take action? And so that got us into thinking and working about, uh, working with using satellite observations. Um, so almost, you know, real-time satellite observations, using low-cost sensors, which is sort of a new paradigm shift in, in being able to observe smoke. Um, using artificial intelligence to, to understand what's going on and also using visualization tools and apps. And what I'll do now is I'll briefly take you through just some of those where we've got to. Um, so the near real-time smoke intelligence um, requirement led us to building a tool which was specifically aimed at for showing where the smoke forecasts were going, bringing in all of the available observations in, in real time which we could overlay on top of the, um, the forecasts. So, you know, it may have been that we fired the model off at 10 o'clock in the morning and by 12 o'clock we've, um, you know, we're forecasting a certain level of smoke. Well, what did the observations show at that time? You know, how good was the forecast? Um, if it was starting to match the observations, what does it tell us about the smoke concentrations away from those observation sites? Um, so that we can, we can then factor that into providing warnings and in the example I've got there, um, typically what we used to have was the traditional, as we would say, EPA monitoring sites. So these are like $100,000 assets, um, which they would have located close to population centres, um, but limited because you know, budgets are limited and um, you have to sort of choose carefully where you site these, these assets. But then on top of that, we are now developing low cost sensors, which are maybe a few hundred dollars and which we can tune to be accurate and we can push those out to other sites. On top of that, um, we pushed out an, an app called Air Rate of Smoke, which um, the population could use to uh, alert us as to whether they were seeing smoke plumes. They could take photographs of them um, to their health symptoms um, if they were being influenced by the smoke. And we could take all of those um, bits of information and we could triangulate to show where the smoke source actually was and um, perhaps how high the smoke plume was going. So we were using crowdsourcing to um, improve our spatial awareness of what was going on. And we were using the low cost sensors too to, to help with that spatial awareness. Um, and packaging all of this up into um, an application that we could use to overlay all of that information in real time. Let's just talk about low cost sensors for a second. At CSRO we've developed a unit called um, smog, um, smoke observation gadget, and um, it consists of a few quite low cost um, components. So it has this um, sensor called a plantail sensor, which um, actually can measure scattering of light and from that determine um, particle loading. It has a um, just, just a very um, small low cost um, computer, which drives the whole thing. Um, LEDs, which then indicate you know the level of smoker around, and you can package all of that up into what's basically a lunchbox size um, container. And um, if you include communications, that will then talk to the cloud. And so as soon as you turn it on, it links to the cloud, and you have this information coming up in real time, which then again go into our system, 
and tell us about what's going on at different locations. And for us, that's been a, a real sort of shift in innovation um, or paradigm shift because you now have this very low cost way of um, looking at what's going on around a region. And it means you can deploy these instruments in large numbers to help fill in the gaps. So we developed this um, unit, it's called a smog unit. As it turns out, um, it does work quite well. So what we've done is we've compared it to high cost units, you know, the gold standards. And what's been shown in this plot um, is a couple of these smog units being compared to high cost units. And what they tend to do is, provided um, the source of the fine particles is smoke, they track very linearly against each other, but they may not track on a one-to-one -one basis. However, if you um, actually do the calibration of the high cost unit against the low cost unit, then that calibration holds pretty tightly over a period of time. So you can then correct um, the observations of the low cost unit to what the high cost unit and the truth would be. And so if you set the system up in that way, it then gives you this very expansive network of um, observations which you can um, statistically correct to be quite ac accurate. So we've done a lot of work on testing and deploying these units. And, um, and so the other thing that we've also pushed is community, community engagement. And um, we've taken that pathway by working through STEM. So setting up a curriculum that um, we can then teach to um, primary school aged kids about um, smoke and air pollution. And a key part of that curriculum is taking these smog units and building them, running them, taking them home and running them, and then analyzing the results. And it really brings, um, brings the children from you know, the various communities that we've looked at um, into thinking about smoke, into um, doing science observations, into doing science analysis. And um, I have to say, they just love it. It's just, it's just great, great to see. And we've, we've actually run it across three schools. So Wattle Park Primary Schools, where we had originally um, pulled together and tested the curriculum. And then we deployed it out at Anglesey Primary School and Polara Primary School later on. And, and it got extensive use. And now uh, it looks like this will be deployed out on quite a large scale, you know, providing this information to, to, school, to school children. And the useful thing from that too is that we can use the information as well for the forecasting. So the community engagement feeds back then into running these technical forecasting systems. Yeah, and the third thing was um, having got the data, they, um, the students where, where we tested were very good at doing the data interpretation. And we had people visiting in from um, CFA and from DELP and, and the CSIRO scientists to work with the students and the teachers. Um, to push through this level of sort of science technology and it's turned out to be very successful. At the moment it's, um, it, it, it's been like a bit of a pilot study I guess. We've, um, we, we originally tested the curriculum at, at one school, at Wattle Park Primary School, um, and from there we've deployed that out to a, a couple of other schools o over the summer and um, it went really well. Um, you know, the children just, I think, love tinkering with these things, putting together bits of kit, um, you know, learning about the smoke and the issues, and then taking the instrumentation home and switching it on and, and, and doing the sampling for the smoke. And so they did that for a while and they brought that back in and um, sat down with, with our scientists and people from CFA and DELP and did analysis of, of the information. So it's been great. And the, and the really useful thing for us too is that we can use that data in the forecast modelling. So the work that they're doing helps us with the forecasting for the rest of the community. Um, and so we're looking now at growing it, um, potentially you know, across Victoria and then through the rest of Australia if we can get people on board. So we're very keen to see that happen and um, one that will really help with the communication and the education for, for um, smoke impacts and it will help with the forecasting, will make the forecasting more accurate when and where we can use the information that's being streamed from people's um, the devices that they're switching on for us. Well, the next, the final thing I want to talk about is um, satellite data. We know we got a lot of satellites up there. Um, we have one particular satellite that was um, uh, launched by um, our Japanese co colleagues, the Japanese 
mythological association um, called Himawari, Himawari 8. And it's a geostationary satellite which sits over Japan. Well, it, it actually sits over the equator, but it's close to Japan. And we also lie within its footprint. And the really good thing about geostationary satellites is you have very high time frequency observations. And in fact, Himawari 8 is um, observing the local region at about some um, 10 minute time steps. Um, and so you can see things evolve very rapidly. And by way of example of that, one of my colleagues, um, Dr. Grant Williamson from University of Tasmania, has taken the Himawari 8 feeds for this last summer. And what, what he's doing is he's going to show what we call hot spots. So these are thermal anomalies, which are areas where we have the fires. And um, you can see those in that plot starting to light on and off. And so these are, um, I think he's done, he must have done this hourly. So he's um, being in the hot spots, so every hour. And that's high enough um, time resolution so you can see the fires evolving over time. And then under that, he's overlaid the areas that have been burnt by the fire. And so if we track this through over time, we can see where the fires are burning, and then you can see the burnt areas behind them which just gradually grow over time. So provided it's cloud free, it's just a very powerful near real time tool for looking at what's going on. The only challenge with the geostationary satellites is that because they're 36,000 kilometers away, their typical resolution is about a kilometer. Whereas um, the polar orbiting satellites, which is the other source of information, they're, they're sitting, um, you know, five, seven hundred kilometres above the ground and they have resolutions down to um, tens of centimetres. But nevertheless, you know, that trade-off um, is still very useful in terms of having that, um, being able to see the temporal evolution of um, the fires over time. So very powerful. And quite frightening to see, I might say, too, um, from what we've just all been through. So how do we use that information? Well, one of the things we do is we take the hot spots. These are the thermal anomalies, um, which indicate fires. And so, for example, here we're taking hot spots. We're clustering them into just the local fires. And then um, from that, we can determine an area that's being burnt. And for that typical type of fire, we can then work out the emission rates. And that's what we're seeing on the, the top right there. And then that can go into the model and we can then forecast smoke from those fires. So it gives us a chance for clear weather conditions to observe all the fires burning across Australia and then to put them into the system and see where the smoke is going to go. And we can do that on a daily basis. And so that's, that's actually done by a lot of people and, and we're doing that pretty routinely as well. But we can also do better than that. And this is work that we're doing at the moment. And that is if we use Himawari 8 and the top left plot there shows the footprint of it, and we're very fortunate that in Australia we're right in the footprint of Himawari 8. It has 16 different channels um, that it observes um, radiation over, all the way from infrared through to, through to visible. And we can actually process that information to tell us where we can see smoke. And the animation that you can see on the right there is how we process that information to detect smoke. The red dots um, are hot spots. So that's where the fire is burning. And then the um, coloured emissions coming from that is the actual smoke that we're seeing from 36,000 kilometres away every 10 minutes. So it provided, again, that it's clear, um, it's this very powerful tool for then identifying where smoke plumes are in near real time. And you can get that information probably an hour or so after it's been, um, it's been collected from um, the geostationary orbit. So, Given that information, and there's a lot of it, as you can imagine, because that's one fire and we've got the whole of Australia, well, what can we do with it? And what we've done is we've turned to artificial intelligence or machine learning to take that information from Himawari and to, we've trained it to recognize what the smoke patterns look like. And so this artificial intelligence, and this is sort of the top plot there, is um, we're telling it, is it clouds or is it smoke? Um, and then teaching it to recognize the cloud or the smoke so that it can then just run on its own, look at an image coming out of the Himawari 8 and say, well, this is smoke. And this is the source of the smoke. Here's the hotspot here. And now, you know, 
what do you want to do about that? So you do the training and then you do the prediction given that. And that's what we're seeing in the bottom there. And just to give you an example, the animation there shows what we know is to be smoke. And then the artificial intelligence algorithm is when it predicts it to be smoke. And the really good thing about the artificial intelligence algorithms is it's really fast. It can um, do these smoke predictions very, very rapidly. And um, so, you know, you have this tool. So it's almost like us sort of looking at the image, you know, image after image after image and saying, yes, that's smoke. And now we have this computer algorithm which will do it for us. So if we have that, then we have this, this prediction of the smoke and we can do it very quickly. Well, what can we, what can we do with that? And what that does is it gives us an option for a fully automated smoke forecasting system. And the way that this works then is the Himori satellite takes a snap of the image across the whole of Australia, for example, and within 30 minutes that's come down to a ground station where we can analyse it. We can then run that artificial intelligence algorithm across it for the whole of Australia, and where it's cloud free, it'll tell us if there's smoke or not and where the source of the fire is. And if we say that there is smoke and here's the fire source, we can then run the bushfire spread tool. So this is the fire propagation algorithm that I showed you earlier. And that too turns out to be very fast to run. It'll do a 48 hour simulation of a fire in about five seconds. And with that, we can then work out what the emissions are. And that takes about 10 seconds. And then we can run that through the full chemical transport model, as we call it, where the fire is emitted and transported and spit that out to a communication site we think within half an hour to an hour um, running as a fully automated system. So um, that's the scheme that we're currently spinning up to try and very useful for parts of Australia where we don't have good ground based intel on what's burning. This can just be running automatically in the background. So that's one piece of work that we're, um, we're working on and moving towards at the moment. And the last thing I wanted to talk to you about was um, communication. So working with DELP um, is, is, is fantastic, but the way that DELP work is they have like a central office in Melbourne and then they have offices all around the regional centres as well. And they need to come together every day to do decision making based on, um, for the fires and the prescribed burns from all the remote sites. And so what we've been looking into is how could we improve that decision making process? And one of the ways to do that is to use augmented reality, where you put on a headset and um, if you all link into these headsets, you can see each other around a table as avatars. And this is what we're seeing on the right hand side there. And you can take, say, the output from the AQFX system as avatars on that table and look at what's going on and manipulate it and discuss it. So it's using cloud based augmented reality. Okay, let's see how the bushfire went back in 2016. Uh, hmm. Show gradient. Okay, right. The weather station is popping up, so it looks pretty severe over Tasmania. Um, height wind. Hmm. I need to see the satellites. Show Himawari. Right. Okay. So, looks like the wind was pretty strong up there too. All right. Height Himawari. Height Gradient. Um, I guess I'll put a wind back on. Show Wind. Cool. So I think this um, shows the potential future for communication with these, um, these types of systems. We have a complex system, um, you have a distributed network of people who are wanting to make decisions together. You can bring them into a room, into a virtual room together where they can interact with each other and with um, the forecasts that are coming out and to expedite the decision making process. And my final slide really relates to um, AQFX and, and the summer fires that we've just had. So we have this system, as which you've seen, we've primarily built it up to look at prescribed burns, but we've also had that capability of looking at large-scale bushfires. And it has been strongly tested over these, these last few months um, at, at the Australia scale, um, with a particular focus on the eastern seaboard. And um, so what we've found is it's, it's generally performed quite well. <clears throat> um, it's been used 
a lot for doing health forecasting. It's also fed into aviation forecasting and I believe even into ADF operational forecasting as well. And so um, it stood up quite well. We're now um, planning to do a very detailed evaluation of its performance and look at where we can improve things, where they need to be improved, and um, then look at you know, what else needs to be added into the system to further increase its robustness over time. And so that's work that's currently in progress. And the final thing is to just note the teams, the people who've worked on this system over the last five years or so. Um, it's very much been a team contribution um, working across the universities, the Bureau and CSIRO, and that's a wonderful thing to be involved in. Thank you. We're working in an area where we're, we're very much doing public good research um, and you know where we're trying to protect our population and you know trying to bring in the best science and <clears throat> work with the, the best um, um, agencies to, to ensure that this goes out and so we have this close relationship with the Bureau who are running the system operationally and we also have close relationships with the university sector um, who often do the, the underlying research that will feed into the work that we're doing. So I think that's very important. And the fact that we are able to work with communities um, through the STEM programs and through the use of the low-cost sensors um, strongly adds to what we're doing and um, you know it ends up becoming a whole of community, both the research and, and the population community um, piece of work, which which has the ultimate target of protecting everybody from uh, smoke.